Good morning once again and welcome to another week of Together for Christ podcasts in which we're following the Scripture Union Word Live passages, taking us this week through Luke's account of the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus, appropriate as we come towards the anniversary of those events in our Easter weekend next Friday, Saturday and Sunday. I'm Stuart Smith and with my friend and colleague Colin McLeod, we'll be reading and thinking about and praying through these passages from Monday through to Saturday. Reading today in chapter 22 and beginning at verse 39 after we have prayed. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your call to action into your service but also for your leadership of us and your provision of all the things that we need and all the things that we cannot do for ourselves. And so as soldiers of Christ, we would arise today at the command of your Son to go out into the world equipped with his orders to do your will. So use your word today to teach us, indeed to command us what we must do so that we can follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 22 from verse 39. Leaving there, that was the upper room where Jesus had shared bread and wine with his disciples. Leaving there, he went, as he so often did, to Mount Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when they arrived at the place, he said, Pray that you don't give in to temptation. And he pulled away from them about a stone's throw knelt down and prayed, Father, remove this cup from me, but please not what I want, what do you want? And at once an angel from heaven was at his side, strengthening him, and he prayed on all the harder, sweat wrung from him like drops of blood poured off his face. He got up from prayer went back to the disciples and found them asleep, drugged by grief. He said, what business do you have sleeping? Get up, pray so you won't give in to temptation. And no sooner were the words out of his mouth than a crowd showed up. Judas, the one from the twelve in the lead, came right up to Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus said, Judas, you would betray the Son of Man with a kiss? When those with him saw what was happening, they said, Master, shall we fight? And one of them took a swing at the chief priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Jesus said, Let them be, even in this. And then touching the servant's ear, he healed him. And Jesus spoke to those who had come, high priests, temple police, religion leaders. What is this, jumping me with swords and clubs? as if I were a desperate, dangerous criminal. Day after day I've been with you in the temple, and you've not so much as lifted a hand against me. But do it your way. It's a dark night, a dark hour. Amen. And I pray that God will bless these words to us. Familiar words, of course, Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then his arrest by the mob sent by the Jews to take him into custody. Familiar but useful to look at the rights and wrongs that are highlighted for us in this passage. First of all, the rights and the wrongs of prayer. The right is Jesus, the way that he falls to his knees and prays before his Father, a model for the way that our concerns should be brought before the throne of grace. What we see is Jesus uh, submitting to his Father's will, even though he doesn't feel able to do it. He pleads with God to take away the cup of suffering from him so that he wouldn't have to endure the physical and emotional and spiritual pain of the crucifixion that was ahead of him. I don't want to do this, he says. And he asks God in a very human way not to inflict that upon him, but his own will is secondary. Whatever you want is the final submission. And of course, that needs to be our prayer, that we don't just pray long and hard for what we want until we get it. 
but we pray with open minds and open lives to God's alternatives, that what we hope for, which might be our own comfort or avoiding some testing time that we see in prospect, or might be some other thing that we think to be our duty, something we deeply desire for another person or to improve another situation. And we pray, as Jesus said we should, like that widow before the unjust judge. She didn't stop praying until she got what she wanted. We pray on and on, as Jesus does here. It's a lengthy prayer, but always with that qualification, not my will, but yours be done. So we pray open to God's alternative and then receiving God's assistance because we see that as soon as Jesus opened his mouth to those words in prayer, not what I want, what do you want, as soon as that happened, an angel from heaven was at his side strengthening him. And so prayer is a process by which we express what we want but remain open to what God wants and receive the strength to bear what is against our wishes. But even then, the prayer did not end. When the angel came, Jesus did not breathe a sigh of relief and bring his prayer time to an end, but rather redoubled his efforts. And we see the the tears falling from him like drops of blood. And on and on he prayed, eh, coming to terms with what he did not want with the angel's assistance, but also through a long, drawn-out process of anguished prayer. So there's a picture there of not perhaps what prayer always is for us, but what it sometimes has to be, that it takes us time to accept what God wants, and prayer is the process by which we do that. Heaven helps us, but that doesn't make it easy, and there can be long, anguished, troubled times before we're able to be reconciled to the will of God. So that's the model of how prayer should be. And around it are the disciples whom Jesus leaves with a warning, but then returns to and finds them sleeping. And we've probably got some sympathy for them. They'd had a long day, some exciting times, lots of lesson to learn. They've had a good meal. They've drunk wine as well as eating bread. And it's perhaps not that surprising that we find them asleep. But looking at the other details about their prayer is, first of all, Jesus' warning to them, I pray that you don't give in to temptation, And then the reason giving for their sleeping, it says that they were drugged by grief. So not just the ordinary tiredness of a long, hard day, but deep upset. Upset perhaps because Jesus had told them that one of those who was at the table with them was going to betray them. So they were questioning themselves and questioning one another. The fellowship and the friendship that they enjoyed so long was clearly being deeply disturbed in some way. So they were upset by that. And perhaps that's the temptation Jesus warns them about, not just the temptation to fall asleep when they should be praying, but the temptation to give in to despair. Um, And in fact, that's what happens. They fall asleep in their grief, drugged by grief, it says, perhaps self-pity overwhelming them. So instead of turning their attention to God and pleading with him as we see Jesus doing in his ongoing anguish until he finds resolution, perhaps they clam up in self-pity and turn their thoughts inwards and worry about the future and sink off into a troubled sleep, uh, disturbed by the news of what they have heard. So we have Jesus who wrestles on in prayer until resolution is found, and we have disciples who give up in grief, because they're not getting what they want. And uh, it's easy to see which of these two models would be the right one for us to follow when things go wrong. And then immediately after the prayer time comes this arrest of Jesus. And there's two different, what turn out both to be wrong examples from his disciples. One from Judas, who betrays him with a kiss, and that's obviously wrong. And Jesus accuses and exposes him here. But the second error is, the other disciples who draw their swords in his defense and attack one of those, the slave of the high priest who has come to drag uh, Jesus away. And again, it's not surprising that the disciples should do that. Not only do they love Jesus, not only do they have a strong sense of right and wrong here, and they want to leap to the defense of the one they love who is 
facing danger or abuse or exploitation here. But if you look back, you will see the last thing that Jesus said to them before they left the upper room was make sure you've got your purse, your bag, your cloak, your tunic and your swords. And if you don't have a sword, sell something to buy one. And they found that they had two swords among themselves and he told them that would be enough. And now here he is suffering violence. So surely the natural thing to do that Jesus has prepared them for is to draw their swords and fight back. And yet Jesus says, no, you've done the wrong thing again. He heals the person that they hurt and he tells them to put their swords away. Why is that? Why was it wrong for them to defend him here. It's always going to be wrong for Judas-like betrayal. Of course, we know that and must pray for the strength to be faithful and honest. But it seems that at this time, there is a kind of honesty, a kind of support that was out of place or improper at this time. There are times when we should fight for the weak and defenceless. And if we were in a park sometime and we saw a defenceless person being set upon by a mob, then hopefully we would do something about it, either go to the rescue ourselves or at least call the police and see that the wrong should be righted. But on this particular occasion, that was the wrong thing to do. And Jesus tells us why. At the very end, he says to the temple guards, do it your way because it's a dark night a dark hour. And that's because we have come to this moment in the Gospels when what was evil had to be done. The will of God was not to stop the assault from taking place, not to stop the unjust trial from reaching its predetermined verdict, not to save the innocent man from his death on the cross, but to let evil have its way. Satan, who assaulted Jesus after his baptism, and uh, three times was frustrated and went away until another time now comes back in the person of Judas and these soldiers and the priests and then the Romans to put Jesus to death. And this time there's no resistance because God knows the hour has come for death to do its worst and exhaust itself by throwing its all its weapons and all its arms against one who cannot be defeated. Jesus doesn't need to be saved from arrest because he cannot be held by death. And the fact of his death will prove the power of his resurrection and bring glory and hope to generations to come. So it's not that the disciples were wrong to try and defend him here, and there may even be times when violence or restraint is the right thing to do. We'd want our police to be well armed when they were coming to rescue people from violent criminals. But this time, on this occasion, drawing the sword coming to the defense of Jesus was the wrong thing to do because this time evil had to have its way. This time for the last time it would be given free reign to show that it could never have any power again. So let us be ready for times of anguished prayer, turning to God in hope and trust rather than giving in to self-pity when times are tough. And let us be ready this week to see Jesus heading for that inevitable end for which he had prepared himself that we can do nothing to save him from because he has done this to save us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the means of defence that you have given us, both the security of our nation, our armed forces and the police and our legal system, and our own ability to help and strengthen one another and to come to one another's aid in different ways. And we pray that you would help us all to take responsibility for one another and to look after each other in those situations. And maybe there will be times today when we need to come to the help of others in need. But we thank you that you were ready to go without help to the cross because you knew that was what needed to be done and nothing could save you from the fate you did not deserve if you were to save the world. So hear our prayer of gratitude for your submission and our commitment to doing the best that we can with the freedom that you have bought us with the life of your Son. Hear our prayer in his name. Amen. Thank you for joining today with me in Bible reading and in prayer.